put a little bit of yeah. sugar and some salt. All right, I think Jeff is going to be a little bit late. <clears throat> um, so we should get going on this. All right, welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to call this meeting to order and my our first order of business is I will accept a motion to go into executive <clears throat> session. So moved. Second, this is Wendy. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And please note that Jeff is is not here. Okay. Who's, uh, who else going into this session? The board members, Kyle, Andy Hamilton, and myself. And Darlin. And sorry, and Darlin. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Darlin. That's okay. <laughs> I didn't think it bothered you. No. <laughs> nice sweater. Sweatshirt. Thanks. With the pause. Okay. Hi, hey, Jerry. So, do we all have to cut off the screen while you guys are in executive session? Uh, we have a what's called a breakout room that I'm assigning just the people he told me. Oh. Uh, to okay, go. so we can just sit here and wait till you're done? Yeah. But where's Tony? All right. You're still here, Tony. Tony's here, yeah. You were going, oh, there you are. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. And now we wait. Does anyone know why they went into executive session?
All right. Is everyone back? Okay, we're back. Here I am. Yep. Okay, awesome. Great. All right, uh, we're going to move on to post executive section session. All right, uh, we received a pe petition uh, regarding the causeway on Northern Neck. Um, and I'd like to briefly hear a word from our town council on this, Andy. So the uh, petition that was presented um, was a petition that set forth uh, four essential arguments as to why the uh, town should accept um, the um, uh, Long Neck um, Causeway as a public way. Um, I think there's um, some real foundational challenges uh, with that based upon the fact that the causeway when originally constructed is constructed in uh, the lake. A, the, the lake is more than 10 acres in size. Um, so it is a great pond under state law. Great ponds are considered to have what are called submerged lands. Um, whereas there was a submerged land lease uh, that was issued at one point so that the town could facilitate uh, what appears to be a private project that was conducted. Um, here's the foundational problem uh, for the town. The town cannot undertake an act which is um, ultra viris or beyond the authority of the town. In this case, if we come from the bottom up with a causeway, the bottom of the lake is called submerged lands. The causeway when constructed was constructed um, um, on state lands. The only authority in Maine that can give up state property is the legislature. Um, so without um, a clear approval by the Maine legislature. This property is state land. It's built on state land. Uh, the causeway, although a private causeway, is built on state land. Even if there had been a proper petition to seek town meeting approval of this, um, the selectmen um, have both the power and the obligation to reasonably refuse to place before town voters um, those petitions that seek either an illegal action or an ultra viris action. Here, the action that's proposed to accept this as a town way is an ultra viris action, Latin for beyond the power of the town. So the, the, the town in this instance has no authority to um, make this uh, uh, causeway a town way. And I can address each of the four um, um, items, the, the four arguments that were presented in the petition, they were presented clearly, um, but I think there's, there's, there's some questions about the statements that are made. The first uh, statement is that the petitioners state that they're not a road association um, uh, and that they have no pow power to compel other lot owners to contribute to road maintenance cost. Um, so Maine law does provide a very simple procedure for people who share the use of a private road to choose a board or commissioner to oversee the road's maintenance, to compel all owners on the road who have the right to use the road to contribute their fair shares to its maintenance and to place liens on the lots of any owners who don't pay. The procedure requires little more than calling a meeting and giving notice to all of the lot owners sharing the use of the road. So, <clears throat> There, there is no suggestion, nor there could be, um, that the petitioners have no reasonable alternative uh, to, to having the, the town assume res responsibility because there is a clear procedure under Maine law for the private owners to form a road association. The second uh, statement is that the causeway, uh, because it's not owned by anyone else, it must be owned by the town. Uh, indeed, as I've said, and I've, I've, I've confirmed this with uh, two attorneys in my office who are familiar both with the Great Ponds Act uh, and the layout of any private roads uh, on causeways, and there are many in the state that have causeways across submerged lands. Um, there, there is no such legal principle that if you can't find the owner of a property, it must be a town property. Um, that does not follow. Um, more importantly, we know the owner of the causeway. The owner of the causeway is the state of Maine that's built on submerged lands. 
So the state of Maine is the party uh, that would have to convey its interest. And um, I don't know that the town should ever support any legislative effort um, to, to, uh, to have the, the state to convey its interest, even if it could. Usually the state leases such land and does not convey it in fee, uh, except in certain limited instances. The third um, um, premise was that the petitioners suggest that because the town was involved in an earlier project involving a submerged land lease, um, then the town has become responsible for it. Um, we have numerous instances where municipalities facilitate getting rights from the state Department of Transportation um, because private um, um, owners cannot. And so the towns will very often facilitate a private project uh, securing uh, rights from Maine DOT or from other state agencies. The simple fact that this uh, town might have facilitated a private project does not suggest that that caused it to be a town way. There are very specific procedures for when a town <clears throat> makes a <coughs> private road a town way. Um, the records have been carefully researched for the town of Mount Desert and never has the town followed any of those procedures to make it a town way. And again, even if it had um, tried, it would be doubtful that it could have ever done it because the submerged lands of the state are owned by the state and the causeway is on submerged lands. Um, so I think for those reasons, um, it, it is beyond the authority of the Board of Selectmen to place this before the town. Of course, the town meeting has to act on any effort to lay out a town way. Um, and you'd have to take that town way. You'd have to take it from a property owner, in this case, the state of Maine. It's beyond the power and authority of the state, excuse me, of the town to take property of the state. So um, I think that makes it clear that although the petition was presented very clearly, it was not pre presented as a petition for a town meeting, even it were, if it were presented as a petition for a town meeting, we would advise um, the Board of Selectmen similarly, you're, you not only have the privilege to refuse uh, forwarding such a petition onto town meeting, you're obligated to because it would be an ultra various action of the town. Happy to answer any questions that you, um, you have. May I speak? Sure, go right ahead. I'm Bill Waters, I'm one of the petitioners and I actually prepared a presentation for tonight to, um, to show you the audience exactly what the situation is. I can do that now, but um, our point on putting this before the Board of Selectmen is somewhat determined because of COVID. Our initial goal was to sit down with uh, Derlin and Tony and try to talk through how do we deal with it, with this hazardous situation. Um, so I'm not saying that the answer is to go put it before the town meeting. It may be something along with the state, but this is a very severe situation and we're hoping that the town has some uh, contribution to trying to solve it. My wife almost lost her leg there last summer and it's, it's a horrible situation. Do you mind if I share the screen? No, oh, go ahead. Control. Share. <clears throat> I'll, I'll just skip to the point. Um, I think people know where Northern Neck is, but the causeway is right here. The culverts that we're talking about were put in in the early 80s. You can see the situation here. They're totally deteriorated. And um, oops, sorry. Um, I'm skipping. There we go. The problem here is very obviously you can see all the jagged metal, but the real problem is my wife's injury was here because she thought she was getting out on a sol solid culvert, and here there are holes underneath the water that are invisible and her leg went into one of those holes. She sliced her leg open from the knee all the way to the ankle with all of the bone showing. We had to, to tie
tie the, the leg back together with our t-shirts while we waited for an ambulance. This is a very, very severe situation. It's not only the residents of Northern Neck that are affected, we have kayakers that, that pull across that causeway every day. People come there to fish. Somehow we need to find an answer and we're looking for the town's help to come up with a solution. Um, so I understand the legal situation, but there's gotta be some uh, help that the town can give us to help solve this problem. Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> uh, Bill, I'm so sorry about your wife's injury. Uh, it sounds horrific. Um, and it certainly looks like the culvert needs to be replaced. As I understand it from our attorney, um, it's not the town's responsibility. It seems to me that the best option would be for the residents of the road to form a, um, an organization and replace the culvert. And that may be the long-term answer, but with the, the culverts in that situation, would you take responsibility for a road association with the liability associated with that? Even if it's only there for a year? I, I certainly would not want to get involved to City take on that liability. Not be coming out for their appointment. I'm sorry. Uh, I think somebody somebody wasn't muted. <laughs> so anyway, I think that there, there may be some long-term answers there, and my uh, compatriots Rob Shea and Bob Foster may have some more comments there, but. The problem is severe, and as somebody who I talked to earlier tonight pointed out, that if somebody gets sued and or somebody gets injured, and people are reaching out um, to for the liability, and there are no owners other than the state, the town is likely to be um, brought into any lawsuit. So it's it's not purely as well defined as as we might like, um, but the problem the problem is one that I, I, I'm hoping that people have some creative solutions to getting it done and quickly if we can. Go ahead, Tony. You're Mute. muted, Tony. You're You're muted, Tony. Tony. That was the best part. You know, I understand uh, there's no road association and hindsight's 2020 probably always any of the other private roads um, a lot of them I'm aware, aware of have road associations with dues um, one thing I was thinking and Bill if we'd been able to get together um, my suggestion or shooting up from the hip is you folks in some form finance the replacement of those pipes create a road association and the dues pay for that over time. Now, does the aid come first or the check in the road association uh, might have to be formed first and you folks agree to finance the, the reconstruction of those pipes and then pay for them with your dues over time. And how do we pay for that in the short term? Finance it. You're going to, your road associate, I don't know all um, the legal rights of a road association. Maybe Andy does if they can borrow money. But again, this is just shooting from the hip idea with uh, not knowing about road associations, what they're allowed. Not. Andy, you had something to say? So if I can just uh, follow up what uh, each of Martha and Tony have said, um, um, Bill, I've seen some pretty um, tough injuries, but I got to say um, that that's, that's a tough injury and, and um, um, empathies um, for, for not only your wife, but your family. That must have been traumatic. Um, yes. Fortunately, she is, is fine now, but, um, um, but it, yes, it was very traumatic. That would have been very hard. So um, I, I do think that what Tony just suggested is similar to, to what I've done. And um, here I'm, I'm, I'm going to having articulated um, the position of the town attorney, 
also tell you that I happen to be a member, if not an officer of a road association and we have a causeway. And um, what Tony suggested, I think is possible. And um, I'd be happy if the town manager is okay with it in terms of an allocation of the town's legal resource to ask John Cunningham what he's seen done because he's kind of our expert on road associations. And my thought is you should be able to find a way to get a loan uh, for culverts um, and, and get those culverts replaced promptly. That is, as you point out by your um, example and by your um, screen share, that is not a safe condition. And I would not want anyone to be in that position. I'm not concerned about the town's liability. I am, however, by nature, a problem solver. And I would love to see the opportunity for um, members of the Future Road Association talk to um, some experts around culverts and just get uh, a prompt understanding of what the project parameters should look like. I don't think it should require you know, detailed design. Uh, I think this is something that could be done fairly promptly. I know Tony has a great set of relationships with engineering firms. Um, and if any one of those were approached, I think they could do a very prompt, um, very preliminary design of, of, of the culvert placement uh, so that it would be effective to pass water to prevent the, the road from washing out. Um, but I, I don't think, Tony, that looks like a very complicated um, culvert replacement project, but boy, those culverts should be replaced mighty soon. Um, so I think, yes, it is possible to get a loan. It's not hard to form a road association. The statutory provisions are clear and it's just a matter of getting people together. And frankly, COVID presents a time when lots of people are available to get associations set up and have votes and, and, and just get it in place. So I, I don't doubt that uh, a bank, a local bank that would have knowledge of the membership of this road association would have any discomfort in providing financing for a uh, culvert replacement. Yeah. If I, okay, if, hold on, just to, uh, go ahead, Tony, John? real quick. Then I have uh, someone raising their hand. Sure. Um, if, if the culverts have to be removed and replaced where they are, it'll be costly. But what might buy time and the requirements may be different for a pipe through a cause, causeway than it is on a stream, we're replacing two culverts on Beach Hill Crossroad. Uh, they're in bad shape. And we, we straddled those in the meantime with inch thick four by eight sheets of steel. Put, went down about six inches. We put gravel over them and then we paved them. Uh, then the concern, and again, it was in the middle of the night, what if one of the, the biggest pipe collapses and we've essentially have a dam on our hands? Um, if that, in that situation, it's a stream crossing by Beachel Crossroad. Uh, we were able to, to slide a new culvert, a plastic big sewer pipe through the existing metal pipe that's rotten as an interim measure with the understanding that we would be replacing uh, both the culverts that were there um, once we uh, raised the financing. Um, that, that's one option if allowed. Um, we could take a look at those bill, the two pipes um, with someone from the DEP and explain to them the, the problem. And I tell you, slipping a pipe through those two pipes and then removing the rotted pieces that you can see uh, would be a heck of a lot less expensive at, for an interim measure, if that is what it turns out to be. Sometimes short-term solutions turn out to be the long solution, but that would be a big cost savings. Okay, I have a question here from uh, Lincoln Milstein. Hi, um, I, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so uh, in 1985, I rented the house, the causeway, and I used to take my two-year-old son, we used to go stand on those coverts and throw rocks into the lake. Um, 
when I read the agenda for tonight's meeting, I actually drove down there today. And, you know, it's, it's what, 35 years later, I was shocked at the condition of the culvert. And I think, I think one thing you need to uh, consider is that there are thousands of kayakers and canoers every summer who port their canoes and kayak over that causeway to get from the west side back to the east side. And the problem with the culvert is that from the surface, you can't see the rusted part underneath in the water, which is extremely dangerous. So, I mean, I don't think this is really a conversation about cost or who's, who's responsible. Um, I mean, when I saw those culverts today and thinking that thousands of people cross that and potentially could slice themselves up. <clears throat> I think we need to talk to the uh, canoe operator and involve him somehow and, and maybe get them to, uh, or even put up signs, danger signs, uh, as a short-term way to, to, to caution uh, uh, people who are, who are actually uh, uh, using that causeway uh, every day in the summer. Um, it's much more of a public safety concern I think at this point. Mm. Tony, go ahead. If if Bill's group was able to get a road association together and come to an agreement, um, slip lining those culverts that are there now with large, basically either HD plastic pipe, uh, and then cutting away the uh, rotten material so that the new pipes are shown all with the approval, be it formal or otherwise, on a temporary basis. Um, that could be done once the monies are raised. You'd need two pipes, Bill, and an excavator and one dump truck. From what I understand from uh, John Cunningham's first letter, there is the option for towns to provide labor and equipment, but no material cost we we and don't have the equipment big enough to to do that work i i might suggest in the short term that we have some signs installed that say danger area just for lack of better verbiage by who john by the by the northern neck residents i would say yeah yes. yeah because i've looked at this with the northern neck resident and um I haven't seen signs go up. They, they went up the next day after my wife. Oh, are, they, are they still there? Um, well, they, they, they faded because they, they yeah. were computer printouts tacked to a piece of wood. Gotcha. But the rest of the summer, every time I drove across there and I saw somebody with their kids fishing, I said, this is dangerous. And the father would just kind of look at me and say, oh, well, you know, that's not none of your business. People <laughs> More of those signs. We get the same. Get we get the same people on the drop off on our sand pile. Yeah. Hey, Bob, go ahead. Can I speak? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think there is more to this than than has already been presented. Uh, those culverts are part of a public water quality uh, installation. It was kind of at the same time that the dam was taken over by the town to maintain the uh, water level for the Southwest Harbor Water District. And those culverts were a very large culvert put in there to try to help with the water quality between the two sides of the lake. Uh, it's a, and that's a public concern, uh, not the, just the private owners here on the road. Uh, the culvert that was in there was functioning as far as nothing is going to wash out. Uh, water flows back and forth and the, the big ones were put in there by the state and the town back in 83 or so uh, to improve the water quality of the two sides of the pond so it would circulate back and forth. And I don't think that is something that the private owner should have to replace or repair because it was done for a, a 
public sort of uh, reason. And there's already been precedent on a causeway up in Northern Maine where the town took over the responsibility of the private, of the uh, public use areas on that private road. And that's already been established. So uh, it's, a, it's a precedent that's already there. So the town could help uh, finance or help some of the funding on replacing those public culverts. They're not really a private culvert for the private road. They're, they're way beyond that. And that becomes a public issue. At least that's my opinion. John? Go ahead, Tony. Um, if you're willing, I can, <clears throat> you folks want to speak with people at the state of Maine about that. I, I can help coordinate a meeting if you like that. Um, I'm not in favor of financing uh, the replacement of those pipes. Uh, based on my research, it, we didn't put them in. The causeway was built so the man could sell property on Northern Neck on the island. Um, there's there's uh, the fact that there's no road association, in my opinion, was a surprise uh, and even since the time when this issue was raised seven or eight years ago uh, there, there could have been some funds a road association a road association was discussed it could have been established then and some funds could have been set aside as dues or however road association works but I feel like I can, if the petitioners are interested and John, you folks approve it, I could facilitate a meeting. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll stand down. We, Wendy? Um, so I would just, I guess, you know, again, um, you know, Mr. Waters, I appreciate your presentation. I think that was very helpful. Um, our family also has a camp on Long Pond and I kayak down there often and have noticed um, the damage, but, and correct me if I'm wrong, I guess I would ask Andy um, this, it, it's, we really as town, um, this is beyond our power, uh, beyond something that we have the control to do um, as selectmen, if I'm understanding this correctly, but also going back to Mr. Waters' earlier conversation regarding, um, you know, if someone from the canoe or, or uh, someone kayaking or something like that was hurt on that area, they could not come back on the town for that type of scenario because the town doesn't own or have really any jurisdiction over that property. Am I correct when I'm to understand, so I understand this? Yes, in all, in all respects, uh, Wendy, the first major point is that the, the town simply has no authority against the state submerged lands to allow this causeway to be um, uh, converted to, from a private way to a public way. Um, second, I do appreciate um, although it's probably hard to hear in the context of um, the recent injury, it's hard to hear in the context of the current 2021 era, but I do appreciate um, uh, Mr. Smith's point that a road association could have been set up and still can be set up. And the sooner that happens and funds can be gathered, there can be work done on this. It happens all over the state of Maine that we have private road associations. And so I think there is a need. And frankly, to me, the injury suggests the very remedy that has been suggested by the town. The, the challenge towns get into is if they expend public funds on a private way, um, that's, <laughs> that's unconstitutional and it's illegal. Um, you can't do that. And so, there may have been um, practices in other places in the state. There may have been practices even in the town where um, public dollars may have been expended on private roads, but it's not constitutionally permissible. You can't do it. So 
Uh, that doesn't mean that there hasn't already been some good problem solving. And I suspect coming out of the conversation tonight, there's going to be some informal discussion that I think is uh, very, very important. One is permitting. In order to be able to do the slip pipe that, that uh, Mr. Smith was speaking to, somebody at DEP, he knows many of them, would need to come out and check it out and say, this needs to be done almost on an emergency basis. The DEP staff is excellent in, in, in working with the public. You, you could have that happen. That's the first thing. The second is make sure you've got a design that, that can work. But I don't think that's hugely expensive and I don't think it's hugely time on us. It should happen. And then the third piece is just to, to, to put the pipes in place. And so I think the town can help facilitate the expenditure of private dollars on a private project um, to, you know, to lend its, its uh, goodwill and to lend its support and to lend its ideas. Um, but it's, it's, it's simply not consistent with the law for public dollars to be used towards um, private roads. And, this isn't the first time this question's been asked. It's been asked over and over and over again. It's, it's debated all the time. So um, I, I think I, I'm very um, understanding, um, but I, I would say that it's important that we do some practical common sense problem solving around a private road association and get this problem solved. Because it, as you pointed out, Bill Waters, this is a problem that needs to be solved. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right, anybody else? Yes, Rob ahead, Shea. Rob. Yep, go ahead. Uh, uh, I think I heard Tony say that the causeway, the road was put in uh, so a developer could, uh, properties he sold, uh, he could sell the properties, people could uh, drive down to their properties. Uh, uh, I have no, I believe that's true. I have no reason to uh, disagree with that, but I'd like to separate the discussion of the causeway and the road over it from the culverts themselves. Uh, I don't disagree that the road <laughs> over it is private and was there, so people who live on the southern part of Northern Neck, which at one time before the culvert, uh, before the causeway was put in, was an island with water running between it, uh, between the southern part of Northern Neck and the northern part of Northern Neck. Uh, there was flowing water there. And then when the uh, Mr. Flynn, who was the developer, put in the filled in the, the causeway, what we now call the causeway, uh, then the water couldn't, that used to exchange west to east and east to west couldn't do that anymore. And then the town uh, became involved and I'm not saying the town paid for it, but became involved uh, uh, perhaps in an assistive way, which is fine, which is good, uh, with installing the culverts in an existing causeway that had a private road going over it. Now, in the research I've done in the presentation of this petition, uh, I spent the better part of two days at the town office going through planning board minutes, warrant committee, uh, annual reports, uh, looking for the answer or some guidance on why the culverts were put in in the first place. I found nothing. Now, that doesn't mean that it wasn't there. The minutes of the planning board are yay deep. There was a lot of material. I thank Claire for making it available to me. Um, and I kind of enjoyed it. I kind of liked it, but uh, I learned some stuff, but I was not able then or later to find out why the culverts were put in the first place. So in my mind, I separate the causeway and the road going over it 
and state ownership of submerged land and all that from the water going that used to go through the channel unimpeded then it gets filled in with a causeway uh, with dirt and rock water gets blocked the town helps to put in a causeway now the water flows back and forth so to me this could be a water quality issue and from there I argue that the town has gone to great lengths. I did learn this through the looking at the stuff in the town office and else, elsewhere. The town in its course of its history has gone to great lengths to facilitate the health and welfare of Long Pond. Uh, it goes back to 1935, helping to put in fish ladders at the town, uh, at the Somesville Dam. Uh, the town was the legal owner of the outlet dam at Ripples Road and responded to a state mandate to repair the dam so that the water level of Long Pond could be raised by as much as a foot, uh, which uh, that's a, a lot of amount to raise the water. But the biggest thing the town did was that in the early 1980s, the town took over ownership from the state through a, a good agreement uh, for the land at Pond's End. And it now is a very nice park for sunbathers, for swimmers. The town's put out a float for people to swim there. There's a very nice ramp to launch a powerboat. There's a nice sandy area for people to wade nice sandy area for people to launch uh, paddle craft. So the town has a history of helping with the water of Long Pond uh, and has put its own money in that 1935 dam at Zoneville. The town paid for the skilled labor uh, and the materials. Now that's a long ways ago and that's uh, it may be really water over the dam, but so <clears throat> my thinking is I separate the water that flows through those culverts and I separate that and I don't think of that as private. I think of that, that's public, the, the lake is public. That's public water and countless people from the public, from MDI, from Mount Desert, from India, from Japan, come and use this pond and use this water. And it's important that the water quality, that it not be cloudy, it not be murky, it not be green from algae. Uh, it's got to be pleasant or people won't come here. So I'm hearing a lot, you don't have a road association. We don't. I'm hearing a lot, it's a private road. A private developer built a lot down there. That's fine, I get it. I don't argue with it at all. But the quality of the water, is that a benefit to me as a shoreland owner? Absolutely. In the summer, I can go out on my dock I can look, it goes out quite a ways. I can look down through the water in the morning when it's flat and the sun hits it just right. I can look down through the water and see 15 feet down to the bottom. That's a lot of clarity. My grandson comes over twice, three times a week when he's home from college, gets in a boat, goes down the lake, catches a ton of fish. That's quality, that's habitat. And I have a problem with the argument that the cause that the culverts are all on us. Uh, and I mean, I get it because our private road goes over the culverts, but public water goes through the culverts. Plus, I don't know why the culverts were put in other than I can speculate 
that after they were, when the causeway was built, the, the channel between southern part of Northern Neck and northern part of Northern Neck, where water fill, the, that water couldn't flow, couldn't mix. And we know from looking at an aquarium, you need aeration, you need mixing, you need water circulation to keep it clean and to keep it healthy. So I'm speculating, don't ask me to prove it because I can't, but I'm speculating that the town got involved, perhaps in helping the owners, I don't know. But I know the town was involved because I saw town people when the culvert went in, uh, in a participating role. That doesn't mean the town paid for it. I don't know that and I'm not saying that. But I have a problem in, in why was the culvert put in? I think it was for water quality. Does water quality benefit me as a private owner? Yes. But I, in... There are 55 property owners on this Northern Neck. I can stand out on my dock and in one hour, I can count 155 people in boats, paddle boards, kayaks, and canoes who are from the public. And I think that somebody, is it all on the owners of Northern Neck to make sure that the public that uses the town owned park to make sure that the water they see is clear, is not murky, doesn't spew up a, a wave trail of algae. Is it all on us? And so I ask anyone who is listening here, does, because I don't know, does anyone here know why the town or why the culverts were put in in the up. first place. Now, if you do, I would like to know, and you can shut me up really quick if you say because a bunch of owners here got together and, and they were the ones who wanted it and the town helped out. I don't know. Is there anyone here in this group that knows? I would like to know. So the, water, so the road wouldn't wash out. That's why they put the culverts under them. I'm sorry, what? Who's that? It's Chris. I didn't hear what was said. He said so the road would not wash out. The culverts were put in because the road was going to wash out if they weren't. The culverts were put in because the road was going to wash out? Yes. Well, uh, that... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Tony, go ahead. Um, again, I'll... I, I, in my opinion, and my, my summary, then I'll stand down, is the folks need to start working on a road association. Um, and I'm willing to show them, or they can look themselves, what we did at Beach Hill Crossroad as a temporary measure. Again, the slip lining of a culvert that passes water from a brook or a stream is not allowed anymore. We were allowed to do it on a temporary measure. Maybe a slip lining of these two pipes, as Chris said, so they won't, the road won't wash out, um, may be perfectly acceptable to the DEP. But I don't think we should be spending public money because Andy said it's unconstitutional and illegal. John, may I suggest yeah, go ahead. Uh, that I think we've covered this pretty thoroughly and I appreciate hearing from everyone but I think we have a lot on the agenda. Can I suggest yeah. that um, if the petitioners have further questions, we refer them to Tony who has offered generously to help them connect with people in the state. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. That'd be great. At least so John, with, with that being said, um, would it be appropriate to, since we, to make a motion that, you know, in good faith that, you know, we provide as much as we can to support um, these residents for what they need as far as nothing, you know, other than helping them know what they need to do to form this association and, and figure it out. But I mean, I feel like we, as uh, our responsibility would be to decline this position, this petition, because it's beyond the power of what 
we as the board and the town can do at this point. I, I mean, okay. I don't Go think ahead, we actually have to take a vote on this, but what I, what I would like to say, it sounds like Tony has made the offer um, to the best of his ability to offer advice and maybe as a bit of a, an informal advisor. And I think that's important as far as the culverts go, but it also sounds like maybe the, the signage that was put up was not adequate. Um, if you could maybe act as a bit of an advisor on that, whether it be the state actually putting up signage, <clears throat> however we could do that, I think we'd all be in favor of that. Oh, that'd be terrific, great, thank you. Um, listen, I think we have, there are two issues here. One is we, we need to have a motion and we need to uh, accept or reject the petition for town meeting, okay? That, that is first and foremost, yes. Uh, Bob Foster just had his hand up longer than before you started talking about limiting uh, discussion. Okay. Do you think Bob, you go ahead. Talk? Uh, Thank I'm you. It's just that my feeling is this, that this is not just a private problem. This was put in for the water quality of the pond uh, back in the 80s. And if we can remove those and put a standard two foot culvert back in there, then fine, that's, that's what we would like to do perhaps. But, okay. uh, oh, again, excuse me, John. Go ahead, Tony. In response to Bob, that, that might, that, that's a really good reason why that I'm offering to get you guys in <laughs> with the right people at the DEP. Okay, well, my point was that this was a this is a public situation that needs to be resolved. And, uh, I think we need to. I think it certainly needs to be resolved, and I agree with you 100. percent Yeah, and then I'm sorry that this is on this Zoom thing. I would very much rather deal with the board as a, in person. We all would like that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I hear you. I think everyone would like that. Mr. Chairman, if it would be helpful to the board, I might suggest the following form of motion. Go ahead, subject, please. Subject to the uh, Director of Public Works offer to provide his volunteer assistance to the um, um, NEC um, uh, property owners um, that the Board of Selectmen declines uh, and rejects the petition uh, in favor of a private road association being formed to address the cost of the culvert. I would move that motion with okay. apologies that unfortunately I feel like we can't do more even if we would like to. And I'm very sympathetic, but I would move that motion. Second. Good. Okay, Any, anybody else have anything to say? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No, oh, thank you. All right, thank you, Tony, for uh, taking the lead on that. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. Okay. Good job, Robbie. Hi, Connie. Okay, uh, approval, I will accept a motion to approve the minutes of January 19, 2021. Wendy, I would move approval of those minutes as written. And I will second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Appointments, recognitions, and resignations. Appointment of Donna Reese to the Harbor Committee effective February 2, 2021. I move approval with thanks. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No. Nope. Appointment of Robert Bickmore to the Broadband Committee as IT consultant ex officio for the Bar Harbor Fiber Optics Project. Move approval with thanks for uh, agreeing to uh, help out. Okay, great. Seconded. Great, wonderful. Any uh, further discussion? None. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Consent agenda, department reports wastewater. Thank you note from Allison Bork. 
warrant committee minutes from January 12, 2021, and League of Towns meeting minutes from January 26, 2021. Uh, this is Matt, I'd move approval of the uh, agenda as presented. Second. And all in favor. Aye. Okay, thank you. Selectman's reports, any Selectman's reports? Nope. Unfinished business, presentation and discussion including costs, floor plans and an elevation view presented as concept eight of information associated with development of a new public safety building for the fire department and EMS taking into consideration various discussions and instructions to and with staff by members of the select board and members of the public held over the last year with, for reasons of practicality and costs, said building to be an addition to the southerly end of the existing fire EMS station, including similar square footage and floor plans of a prior building layout proposed for the bottom of C Street. John? Yes. Um, thank you for reading that agenda item. Um, we took the advice or suggestion from the last meeting to try to keep the uh, cost down between five and six million dollars. Uh, the range is 5.1 to basically six million for the proposed space. And again, those are high and low estimates. Uh, it, it's imperative that those cost estimates be taken for what they are, the concept costs based on a concept design, the type of flooring, the type of finish on the woodwork, uh, will have bearing on, on the costs. Um, Mike and Basil work really hard to get the floor plan down to what you see now. Uh, we have a representative or two from the design team. If you want the plan shown full screen so people can ask questions, that's, that's fine, but it's pretty much the same but different than the one that was at the base of C Street uh, to the point where Basil has offered for his space to leave it, the rooms empty and he'll furnish them himself out of their resources, including curtains. Um, and you, you have and online in the packet were the floor plans, the site plan, uh, the impact on the parking uh, so the, in, uh, the engineer architect, Mike, myself, uh, Basil's not here, but I see Gibson is here as his rep from the, their board of directors, the ambulance, uh, group, uh, for questions. If the board has any, uh, Tony, Tony, first, I want to thank, um, all of you, uh, Mike, Basil, Tony, and Durlin for all the work you put into this yet another um, version of this building that you're you're so eager to, to build. And I, I really appreciate how you scaled it back and uh, listened to what we had to say. It was terrific. I have one question, Tony. Yes. Um, am I right in thinking that this, like the uh, last building we looked at, um, does not impinge on the parking for the Islanders? It, it does but not in a negative sense. Any parking that is taken up by this project will be relocated on that same elevation. Okay. So I don't know how many um, we agreed to lease to Cranberry. If it's 200, there will be 200 on that same elevation when we're done. Thank you. Yes, you are. And I almost got ahead of myself, John. Oh, John, Matt. Um, yeah, I, again, thank you for, uh, it seems like this is about the hundredth um, version and option we've seen where we're gonna have to go to like Roman numerals or something soon. Yeah. Like, yes. Um, I will say the one positive thing about that is it does show, um, you know, that we've looked at numerous options and I think that's yes. a, a positive, a positive thing. It may not have been comfortable getting here, but I think it's a good thing 
uh, that's sort of what we went through. I will also say, um, you know, I, I'm glad to see the price coming down. Um, I do th expect a spirited debate at uh, the town meeting because we are still talking about a large amount. And I did have a resident reach out to me um, over the weekend with some concerns. And I, I figure, I think these are probably things I think it's, it will be a worthwhile discussion, I think, um, that we end up having over this. But I thought I would pass um, a few of them along. And I, I can't read all the notes I took myself here um, the other day. But, um, you know, there's still, I think we have to be aware there's still a lot of uncertainty um, in regards to what direction we're going with as far as like an island-wide type consolidated fire department. And I think a legitimate concern that Man. what happens if we build this and then we move to a consolidated format, are, are we gonna end up with a, a building way more than what we need in Northeast Harbor? I think we probably all agree there's always gonna need be a need for at least some presence in Northeast Harbor, but will we need yep. um, this much presence? And along those same lines, you know, we were talking, um, I, I think those of us that have been in these meetings, we all realize, and I, I think, I don't wanna speak for everyone, but kind of support this idea that it's gonna be necessary that we go to a full-time professional fire department. And I think we take it for granted that members of the public, you know, we have these meetings, people are free to attend, but I don't think we should assume that people are aware of that. And for some people, just that is going to be mm -hmm. a, a, a big change. And uh, sort of going along those same lines, you know, what happens if this building and then you know, build it and they will come. Well, well what if no. voters decide, well, we're not ready for a full-time fire department yet. And we end up with a partially used um, building. Mm -hmm. And then the last concern, uh, I guess I'd bring up, well, there's two really, um, is that are there cheaper options um, as far as just focusing on living quarters um, to house that 24 seven fire coverage um, that could be done without going with, you know, extra garage bays and things like that. And also, I, I think a good point that was made was, you know, we've said, well, we need a, a good, a nice space if we want to attract firefighters. Yes. Um, I think another valid point is that a better way to attract firefighters is by bumping up their paycheck a little bit, which no. is. <laughs> John? Yeah, go ahead, Tony. I made a list of uh, Matt's four concerns. And yeah, Matt, you're right. We've, we've gone over these before, but I'm glad you brought them up again. Uh, in Mike's work over the last 10 years, um, the most fire calls are in Northeast Harbor. And he's looked at any type of new station that we might get is central to the island-wide consolidation if that ever happens. Um, yes, we've all pretty much accepted the fact we're gonna have a full-time fire department um, I don't believe you're going to get professionals. These are professional firefighters that, as I understand it, are also going to be required to be EMTs. Uh, one, okay, this, the, the, the low end's 5.1, the high around six. People are buying homes, properties priced at that and tearing them down, building new ones. Um, I don't think we'll be able to find a home that would attract the professional to want to move here. Um, the good thing about having good conditions, it's a fraternity. The firefighters are a fraternity. They're going to want to spend as much time as possible together to, to figure out if I go in that burning building with this fellow here, can I rely on him? Can I trust him? If you're eating your meals with that person, if you're exercising with that person, if you're training with that person, you'll develop that, that uh, feeling of, of uh, camaraderie and, and understanding that, yeah, this person has my back. Um, and it's not a case of build it and they will come. It's going to, if we, because in the next agenda item, we're asking for, I'm asking for permission to get a price from Hedifine for design through bidding services. That shows a commitment right there. Well, when we get those bidding services, if the board uh, isn't willing or thinks they're too much and doesn't want to pass that as a warrant article to the townspeople, then that tells a tale as far as uh, the immediate future. 
Um, my, my concern and the ambulance is in the same situation is when I was on 15 years ago, there are 23 volunteers and now there's down to 10 or 12 and eight show up. Um, there's going to be a tragedy. It happened in a town in Maine and three, it, it happened in Maine and it was a tragedy. Um, even way back when, when there were a number of volunteers, there might be two of us show up at a call. Um, a lot of the calls, thank goodness, are false alarms. But you still, as you know, John, you were on. You have to respond to the to the false alarms because you don't know they're false. Yeah. Um, maybe I was a bit ambivalent about this uh, before I get on the fire department, and but what I've learned since, excuse me, this is a real need. Soamsville was looked at. That's cost prohibitive and not an option. Seal Harbor, not an option. Um, the most calls are in Northeast and Mike has laid this out to be a key component of any island-wide um, consolidation because it's not just the fire. Oh, it's, okay, it's the okay. Ambu yeah, ambulance we, as well. Yeah. Could I, I just wanted to- I, I, I Chris Morris that. had his hand up for like 15 minutes. Okay, go ahead, Chris. I just want to thank everyone who's been involved. I know it's been a very trying and long process. I just have two concerns to kind of piggyback with, with Matt's. And I, and I believe our firefighter pay is getting inadequate and at the current rate will be below minimum wage as projected uh, in the future. And that, could, I was told, could be done, wouldn't cost more than probably 10000 a year to go up to the compensation that was authorized during the pandemic. And during that time, uh, as far as I know, and I believe this to be true, that every shift, 24 hour shift was manned by personnel from the Mount Desert Department, meaning they answered the call of duty. And I do believe the pay was an incentive for that. And second concern is I don't want a construction, I worry construction of the building would dictate the need for us for the 24 seven. And I worry as well at times, I'm not able to respond as much as I was 10 years ago. So I, I don't want this, you know, the building to slow our needs of the department. That's it, thank you. Chris, can I cl clarify what you're saying? Are you, can, is your concern that if we spend too much money on the building, we won't have enough money to give raises? Is that what you're saying? No, what, what I'm saying is that right now we could bump up the, to the $26 that was done so during the pandemic for the people. And I was told uh, that that would amount to 10, roughly 10,000 in the budget a year more. My concern with the building is that we delay, we're waiting to staff 24 seven till we build this new building. I just hope there'd be a contingency plan that if we need to go 24 hour seven, that we have the ability to do so. I mean, it might not be pretty to start, but just having a plan. So we're not rushing to do this building or needing to get it done or cut corners or miss something when our need is already there for the 24 seven. Thanks, Chris. I, I understand now. Thank you. Okay, Basil, go ahead. Basil? Hey, this is Basil with the ambulance service. Oh, um, hey, hey, how's it going? Hey, I just wanted to start out by thanking uh, Mike and Tony, obviously, for including the ambulance service in this project. Um, as, as everybody's probably seen or knows about, um, the ambulance service has progressed into the having people on staff 24 hours a day. And our space is very limited. We have a an office downstairs with no windows and and we're definitely you know to the point where we could definitely use some more space um and i and i think it definitely would be beneficial there um you know obviously we don't as a as a nonprofit entity with the town um we'll support you know whatever project the town you know comes up with to get us more space and you know uh, being able to get you know staff our full staff in the building um and obviously we don't want to see the project 
you know, drawn out too long. I mean, cause the need is now, um, but definitely, you know, understand where there's a lot of things at play here. Um, you know, um, some of the things Tony's touched on, um, we definitely, as far as, you know, having our, like where we are, as far as, um, our location being kind of at the end of the road, we have had to increase, uh, staff, uh, wages, um, in order to get, you know, qualified staff, we still use a lot of people from town, but that's been a big thing for us. Um, and having a, a facility with a window would be amazing someday. Um, but we definitely realize there's a lot of cost to that. So, um, just basically saying thank you to everyone. And, you know, we want to continue to do what we can to, or have you guys do what you can to help us. That, that's great. And if you have any questions, just let me know for the ambulance service. Okay, thanks, Basil. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to make the point um, because here people are saying, oh, well, you know, Matt's concerns. The, I was just relaying a conversation I had with someone and whether you agree with some of the points or not, or agree with them to a certain degree, uh, you know, they were given by a concerned citizen, the taxpayer. So I consider them valid and I was really happy to hear them because they're not the only one with these questions. And I just thought this was a good opportunity because it's not the last time we're gonna be asked those questions. And I'm looking at this meeting tonight and we've got what, I think 32 people, which is gotta be some kind of record for us, um, but it's still certainly not town meeting. And I would absolutely be in favor th in thinking about this. This is, this is a community conversation that needs to be had. And so, I'm in favor, if for no other reason, you know, putting uh, this item on the warrant, um, because I think it's a conversation that the community needs to have, and that's the only way to initiate um, that conversation. So, yeah, I agree. Mr. Chairman, go ahead, Gibson. Mikhail, we can't hear you. No. All right, I'll ditch the technology. Is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Fantastic, uh, apologies. Uh, we don't have, uh, we're in a little bit of a snowstorm down here in Massachusetts right now. So apologies for that. Uh, hopefully it's not coming up too strong. Um, I just wanna say thank you very much for the, the opportunity to uh, discuss this, this project. Uh, it's something that uh, I just, to Mr. Hart's point, uh, community might need a, a significant amount of education regarding this. And uh, this is something I've seen in my 15 years with the Northeast Harbor Ambulance Services that one of the pitfalls of the services we provide is that the community really doesn't know about the service until they're in need. And that's a, a wonderful problem to have, uh, but there is an expectation that there is available service uh, and to uh, Tony's point, uh, we really just want to ensure that we're not put in a situation where tragedy then dictates outcome. Uh, a lot of the, the discussions that we're having now in terms of space, being able to have sufficient staff on hand really outlines uh, every attempt to make sure that the community is best served. So I uh, just wanna say thank you very much. Thanks. Go ahead, Jeff. So yeah, this is Jeff Wood. I, I, I wanted to say a couple of things. One, I mean, I know that we've been through this discussion from, from a lot of different angles for quite a long time. And, and, and the last meeting, we, we asked uh, Mike and, and Tony and, and the rest of them to, to go back to work and try to bring back a, a product that was, you know, we had rejected essentially a couple of times in a row and, and questioned pretty intently. And I mean, that's our job to do. And, and they did exactly what we asked them to do, which is to come back with a, with a proposal within the, within the price range estimate that we, that we you know, gave them. And, and, it, and it looks really great. I think it's absolutely true that like what Matt said that you know, the, the questioning process and the public comment and, and resistance possibly is not over. But I, I agree that, I mean, this is, this is what we asked for. And, and I mean, it's, it's too bad that we don't have a lot of the other pieces in play with the police situation that came, you know, as a possibility and then went away. And, 
but this is this is what we asked for and uh i think it looks really good i i don't i'm not going to say i approve of the whole nine yards but i mean this is what we asked for and it, and this is this is a very this is a good product and we should move forward with letting it letting it be more uh, openly discussed yeah good yeah go ahead wendy um so I also had a couple of different conversations um, with people with questions and, you know, I agree that uh, some, some members of the community may not know um, a lot of the involvements until they need it. Um, but, you know, and I'm going to use Tony's quote and say, in my opinion, because this is my opinion, um, good pay and benefits attract good people. A good building might make a little bit of a difference, but I don't know about anybody that is not gonna, in a place to live. I mean, unfortunately, a, a, a home on this island or an apartment that is affordable and good pay and benefits are gonna attract good people. I also would believe that a good firefighter wants to be busy. And if they are, I mean, I was brought up with firefighters in my family and, and I get it. Firefighter, has a, it's a brotherhood. Um, but I would suspect that firefighters would also be, you know, wanna come to places that they're gonna be able to use their skills. And unfortunately that's, you know, a reality that we don't luckily have a lot of that um, opportunity. So I really believe that maybe 24 seven coverage is, is necessary. But I also believe that 5 million, 3 million, 7 million or 10 million for something that we still aren't 100% sure of what the future is going to be is hard. So Never I agree. Sorry, one. I'm finished. I'm sorry. No, my apologies, Wendy. I thought I was muted. All right. Yeah, well, that's unacceptable, Tony. I just apologize publicly. I'm sorry. All right. Sorry, I can't continue. Dylan? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Um, I know you got a lot on your agenda, so I won't take much of your time. But, um, you I'm know, sorry. I. I'm leaving the meeting. Good night, people. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think, um, you know, if, if you approve this and allow this to move on to the to the town board, I think it'll be a referendum um, by the people whether they want to continue and move forward with the 24 seven fire department and EMS. Um, because that's the whole, whole, the whole goal behind this is to provide quarters so we can make that transition. And, you know, again, something we discussed going back to two years, three years, five years. Um, so, and we've, to, to go back to what Matt Hart was saying about, you know, can we do this a little bit cheaper? And I understand Matt, these aren't your comments, but um, I think if you remember when we started this in option one, that's where we tried to find quarters just above the existing truck base and it just didn't work out. We didn't have enough room for all the sleeping quarters and the rooms that we needed. So um, yeah. hopefully this will move forward to the town warrant. And again, I think that's a great place and a great opportunity to explain you know, what we want to do, where we want to head, and, um, you know, what we want to do in the future and, and yeah. answer any questions on this. Yeah, I, I don't think you're going to, I think Thank that's you. a, that's, that's a, I agree in short. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, we're never going to know until we try something, whether or not it's the housing, whether or not it's the salaries and benefits, whether or not it's the facility or the, the promise of an exciting firefighting uh, agenda. Um, but we've got to make a start because we're just going to sit around and, and do the same thing in next year and the year after, and we need to do something. Okay. And I think that if we build a building and we have bays for trucks and we can consolidate some of our equipment um, and address some of the operational issues that, that you mentioned earlier, um, I think that's a good start. So I would certainly love to put this out into the public domain for debate. Uh, Go ahead, uh, Chapin. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm one of the full-time firefighters under Chief Bender, and I'm also one of the 
full-time firefighters that don't live in the town of Mount Desert. And there have been quite a bit of calls during the nighttime hours that isn't covered by full staff that I have been the only one to respond after multiple tomes. And that should be very worrisome for some of the residents that they are relying for me to come all the way from Southwest Harbor, which is about a 15 minute drive to Stonesville Station to have the only engine roll out to go check up on an alarm. That's just something you guys need to see that if I wasn't the one to respond, there'd be many missed calls that no one else responded to. Okay. Uh, John, I have a question. Yeah. I have a couple, couple questions for Mike. Um, first of all, Mike, um, again, I wanna thank you for this and I, I think it's you've done a great job. Um, how many people, how many full-time firefighters would this accommodate and, and, and EMTs? Um, on the fire side, we would have two full-time firefighters working the shift. Mm -hmm. so we'd have two on duty all the time. And the chief obviously would work normal department. And the um, other- EMTs, I, I believe they plan on having one so on duty. Like can yeah, I, this, is ba this is Basil. I'd like to answer for the ambulance service. Sure. <clears throat> so right now we have a staff of, of two people on per basically all the time right now um, to augment, you know, what we've lost with volunteer staff during the pandemic. Um, but as far as going into the future, I mean, there's there's a lot of uncertainty there. And, you know, we're obviously working through things just like everybody else is, uh, you know, as an organization. And um, I, I just don't want to tell you that you know, five years from now, that's that's the plan. I just don't know. So um, that, that's where the ambulance stands with that. That's that's what we're doing today. And that's what we'll be doing for a little while. But, you know, I think where that goes, I don't know. We'll see. The, thank you, Basil. I think the, yeah, no the other sort of question I have for you, Mike, is I know you've talked about increasing the pay. It sounds we're hearing that from several people. It sounds like that's a real priority in addition to a building is is making sure we we continue to increase the pay. Yeah, okay. Um, so on the full time side, I can tell you that our firefighters are paid very well, mm -hmm. comparatively to our immediate area, and I'm including MDI, Ellsworth, Hancock County. Um, so the full time, uh, they're, they're compensated very well. The volunteers, uh, just again, we uh, review of what we do. Uh, if they work a shift, they're getting the same pay as a starting firefighter would, a full-time firefighter. Um, the only place that we're lacking on pay is if they respond to alarms or training. Uh, right now, the current rate is 1480, which again, if you compare that to what a lot of the volunteer and on-call firefighters make in the area, that is the same, if not more. But, I've told Chris we can certainly raise that up to $26, $27 an hour if that's what they want. Um, we'll put it in the budget and if it's approved, we can raise that pay for the on-call. I think you'll want to have Chapin speak at the town meeting. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will if he wants to, but that's I think those happy. are things that, <laughs> yeah, I think those are things that people don't realize what's going on behind the, behind the picture. Yeah. And, and again, I'm, I'm really stressing, this is not going to get better. No. Yeah. The, the trends just show us that it's not going to improve. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chapin, go ahead. Yeah, like Mike said about the pay, that, um, that we're very well paid as firefighters. That's not what drove me to this job. What drove me to this job is I want to be able to protect the residents and of the town of Mount Desert. So the pay for me wasn't what brought me, but having been in, I've been attendance to all these meetings and it kind of sounds like that you guys are focused on the consolidation part between all the towns. But by seeing what went down between the police departments a few weeks ago and that the selectmen shot that down for the town of Southwest, how do we know that won't happen for the fire department section of it? We shouldn't be relying on the future of consolidation if that could just be shot down. Everyone needs to be on board of that. But I think a few towns aren't on board with consolidation. Not everyone is struggling with volunteers. 
yeah, I think that's a conversation for for many conversations down the line. Um, yeah, nothing's a done deal, but we do need a facility, I think. Uh, anybody else? Okay, let's move on to item B, which is the actual voting item. Um, consideration by the Select Board of Authorizing Public Works Director Tony Smith to ask the Public, Sa public Safety Building Design Team of Head of Fine Engineering to provide us a cost for their services for design through bidding related to the development of concept eight described in A above in time to include the cost in the select board packet for staff review with them at their February 16th, 2021 meeting such that C at the February 16, 2021 select board meeting, the select board would consider including said concept plan and associated cost as a warrant article to be acted on by the voters at the 2021 town meeting, be it held in May or a later date as we did this year. I'll move it. I'll second it. Any further discussion? No. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and uh, Wendy, uh, absent. I'm here, thank, but thank I'm you. just listening at this point. Okay, did you vote? I'm abstaining. No, I'm abstaining. Oh, okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. All right, new business. College of the Atlantic Main Street project parking issue. Who wants to take this one? Uh, I'm sorry, John, this is Heidi Smolage. Yeah. Um, and I'm just going back to, there are two items. Are those that motion and second and vote on B and C? Were they combined or were- I they have no idea how this I'm, was written. I'm combining them. Yeah, they're, they're combined. Okay. Okay, thank you. They're kind of relying on each other, I think. Great. I'm going to put that in the minutes. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman? All right. Millard, you're on. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. And I apologize. I have a very weak internet. And so if I put my, my video on, I'm going to lose you. And if I lose you, I apologize anyway. Okay. And I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak before the selectmen tonight. Um, and I, all I can say is, wow, uh, following those agenda items, um, it's wow. That's all I can say. You guys are grappling with some very important issues. So, so I'm going to be brief and just, just say, just give you a little bit of an overview. Uh, my name is Miller Doherty and I'm pro a project manager on the, on the new College of the Atlantic Mount Desert Center that's planned at 141 Main Street in Northeast Harbor. Um, again, it's it's we're, we're planning three apartments, three three um, what we like to say is student apartments, and then one faculty staff apartment and a retail space uh, on uh, on the um, main street, and and uh, <clears throat> we're going. Things are coming along beautifully. The building is performing uh, sustainability wise exactly the way we want it to. I think it's a building we're going to be very proud of, and the planning board and planning department has been so helpful. But one of the issues that we're facing, probably, I, I believe, probably the most important issue that we're facing is parking. And we have, we have uh, on many levels, we have been looking at a, a number of options. Let me just tell you that we're taking some regulatory, we're willing to make some regulatory, um, take some regulatory steps. We do have three parking spaces on site. Um, we plan to, to uh, dedicate a small van uh, you know, a 14 person van uh, to the project and also run a shuttle from school to the uh, back and forth to the, to the facility to get students back and forth. Um, but again, the ambiguity of the land use ordinance that, that requires adequate parking, um, we're pretty sure that the planning board is not going to approve uh, three spaces. And so we've been looking at a number of options and we really we want to exhaust all possibilities. So we're looking at some private spaces where we might be able to pick up a couple of spaces. But um, another option that I wanted to just, just broach was the idea of leasing spaces from the town, much like Cranberry Island does. And I'm, and I'm just not sure what the process would be for evaluating that option. And I was sort of looking for a little bit of guidance um, from the selectmen 
about how, how, what, how, how would one go about requesting help with this? It's a, it's a, you know, again, for us, it's an issue of, of uh, we have plenty of parking at COA. Summer transportation is no problem because of the Island Explorer. We can, we can limit the number of vehicles that are allowed at that facility. Um, you know, we believe in sustainability. We'd like to, you know, make sure that the vans are electric vans and there's a charging station available um, on our site for that, for our project. But, but it's just how do we, do you have any insight or recommendations or suggestions about how we might approach finding the number of spaces? This isn't new. I know, I know you're facing it with, with, um, you know, on a number of fronts, parking is a tough issue for all the towns. Many of you know I sit on the planning board of, of, in Bar Harbor. We, we grapple with these issues all the time as well. And, and so any insight you would have as far as, you know, the history and how we might go about locating just a, just a few spaces that we might be able to dedicate to this project, and if so, how, what's the process? And I'm happy to answer any questions about the, the facility itself. Of course, we could reduce the program and add uh, several more parking spaces on the site, but is that really the way we wanna dedicate? We're trying to get some sort of a critical mass of students that would be, and handpicked. Again, this is not a college dorm. These are students who are, will be active in the community who are teaching at uh, teacher education programs at the local schools or working with, with um, Seacoast Mission or you know, for, for years, Ed Blair took students out to Mount Desert Rock. We, you know, again, students have been living in the town of Mount Desert for a long time. But now this is a, you know, a, an opportunity to really reach out and have a satellite operation. And so I'll be quiet now because you have a lot to do. And I just, I just applaud you for your, what you've already done tonight. Well, thank you, Millard. I think you've approached probably a group of people that knows as much about parking as you do. Um, so I would, I would defer to, to Tony or Jim Willis if he's here, uh, someone that knows what the parking state of the union is in town. Go ahead, Tony. Um, the last couple of summers, a couple members of the Economic Development Committee at different times in July and August have counted vacant parking spots in the Gray Cow parking lot. And there were 15 to 20 vacant spots each time the fellow and someone else counted. That's not a technical study. That was just, I'm gonna go up today and see what we have for vacant spots, if that helps at all. Thank you, Tony. Uh, this is Matt, and just to back up, Tony, it was actually, uh, yeah, our committee chair, uh, Dan McKay at the time, kind of did that informal study. And I, I think Derlin may have snuck up the hill a few times too, just to take a peek. And it was sort of surprising because the narrative was, well, there's no parking. And there was a high percentage of spaces at various times during the day, um, when you think it would be busy, um, that there were actually spaces available. Um, I, I hate to bring up the Main Street project, but I know that's a long-term thing is sort of connecting that area with Main Street in a potential future phase. I think that's going to be open up that parking and make it uh, make people realize it's, it's there. Um, and I will just say the concept of potentially leasing or renting spaces out, I, for me, that's not something I'm willing, willing to discuss because I, the precedent that it sets do we start leasing spaces to business owners along Main Street and saying, oh, I'm sorry, such and such a business only? I, I want to stay out of the, uh, the, the parking business as, as much as we can in that respect. I don't know how everyone else feels. I just, this is Jeff. I just wonder about, I mean, there are some other, the, the Cranberry Island parking, how is, they must have some arrangement that they don't own that property. The town must own that property. I think what Miller is pointing out is, is reasonable that they, that I mean they don't actually need to park in these spaces, but in order to be be uh, approved of their project, they need to have the spaces on their agreement because otherwise they they can't 
can't have as many tenants as many as many people living in the building. So I just wonder if if uh, if talking to the the ferry people or whoever, I mean, there are there are organizations I I think that own spots or lease spots that belong to the town. So it, I just don't know who um, who signs that and who makes those agreements. Uh, to, is uh, is Jeff correct in that saying that Millard um, that you don't actually want to use the spaces you just want to say you got them is that what you're saying? Well, I I don't think that's no I, I don't think that's 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 um, the, the case I think we would what we would do is limit we have I I believe we have the capability because we have parking at COA to limit it one way or the other. To that if 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 we were able to set if we were able to find ten spaces for instance we wouldn't have to um, limit so drastically the number of people who could bring cars to the to the facility if we could find six to ten spaces but I think if we can't we're going to have to rely on uh, people being confident that our students care about I mean again sustainability is a big issue for us and so the students that come here understand but. Some do come with cars. They would just have to park at COA and use the van to get their cars, um, whether that's acceptable or not. If we, I felt, I think we all feel if we could say, you know, we, we, we have another option that we don't, you know, that, that, that we can allow more people to bring vehicles over here because we don't really know what adequate means um, as far as the, the ordinance is, does not stipulate how many parking spaces. And as I said, I, you know, I'm on the planning board in Bar Harbor. I know in Bar Harbor I have to provide one space for every dwelling unit um, for, for in the town of Mount Desert. Um, and your, your ordinance says adequate parking. And so what we're trying to find out is are there options that we might be able to provide if it, based on what the planning board thinks is adequate. That was, that's Miller? really the, yes, please. Hi, Millard. It's Darlene. Hey, hey Darlene. Thank we you. Had a, we, yeah, we had a conversation, you and I, uh, what is it, a week or so ago, and I think the, the question was, if those spaces, if they were, say, within five minutes of the downtown area, in other words, a walk of five minutes, would that be something that the, the college would find acceptable? Well, I think, of course, the college would find it acceptable, I, and I can't speak for the planning board whether they would or not. Do you have a suggestion? Well, I know that there are there is one business, and I won't mention the name of it because they have been approached, that does have a fair amount of space, and they would be within about five minutes of the of the uh, uh, project. Uh, it, would, it would, wouldn't be a whole lot farther away than what the uh, Catholic Church lot is that Cranberry Island also owns and has their people. So it would be a similar, similar distance for the college kids to go to this lot as it would be for the people that down in Cranberry that, park, that come in on the ferry and go up to the, to the church lot. So I'm just wondering, that gets us out, of, if, if something like that were feasible, that would get us out of the bureaucracy of leases and having to go to town meeting to answer Jeff's question, the Cranberry Island lot was a vote of the town meeting and I administer it every year. They put up how much uh, uh, it costs every year. It's an inflationary add on from what the original cost is. So if you're going the route of leases and things, you're gonna to have to go to the town meeting to. To get that sort of approved. This is uh, oh, so Darlene, I appreciate. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry. I was just saying, I was, trying I, to I was just going to say that. this project. I know wants to push forward, and the idea of the longer we have to delay and, and fool along with these sorts of things, then the, it pushes you back. And again, like we talk about the firefighters, we lose another year. I mean, that's it's crazy. We want people right. into the to rebuild the downtown. Mm -hmm but we've got to try to make it happen. So sometimes we, as Pogo would say, we've met the enemy and he is us. Mm -hmm. Kathy, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I was just wondering, who is it that determines or sets the rules about no overnight parking 
in the parking lots that we have that are vacant most of the year. The Gray Cow parking lot and down by the marina. <coughs> Plenty of space for parking, easy walking for students to go back to that spot. But the, the problem is there's no overnight parking allowed. So who makes that rule in our town? The, I think the selectmen with the traffic committee in the police department, I think they can make those sorts of rules about the, the length of parking cap. I think one issue with that um, is like this time of year, and certainly um, it looks like tomorrow, um, that's where we're going to start to see a pile of snow uh, mount up. And Tony might be able to answer, but I think there's a permitting process. You can't just decide, oh, we're going to put our snow here for now. Um, certainly the Great Cow Lot is a more convenient and um, efficient place for you to put the snow from the main sort of mm -hmm. downtown area. But you have to get approval maybe from the state level, is that correct, before you just start placing it somewhere else or am I dreaming that? No, you. we can put it pretty much where we want as long as it's not impacting the ocean, a wetland, a lake, a stream. Um, okay. That's, I'm sure the Great Cow is used because it's convenient. Right. We were all prepared to ask the Harbor Committee if we had to during the construction, say, of Main Street and the Seacoast Mission, if we could take it down into the Harbor parking lot. But the way this, <laughs> the winters have gone, no um, snow. we could put snow there and, and work with the people. We could shovel you out a couple, three spots. Right. Well, one other question I had, um, the... Um, agreement we have with the Cranberry Isles as far as setting aside spaces to lease to the, their town. Uh, that's a multi-year agreement. Is that correct, Darlin? Ten years. Ten year agreement. Have you approached that? I don't know whether every space they lease is actually spoken for. Have you approached yeah. them about maybe kind of like subletting um, some spaces from them during the school year? No. Certainly during the summer, I would approach. suspect their spaces are full, but in maybe the during summer, the year, In they... the summer, they're full. In the winter, they're not. Right. Well, that would during the school year that might provide an option. Just a thought. I have. Thank you so much. It's a great suggestion. I have no idea who I would approach, but I. I will. I mean, I can certainly. Miller. Will will. Yes. You would call um, the the town of the Cranberry Isles. Okay, great. Jim Fortune. Yeah. Talk thank to you. Well, Miller, the Cranberries administrative assistant's name is Jim Fortune. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Tony. Uh, and Dar Darlin, just to answer your question, five minutes is not um, very much to walk. We have people coming across campus. Students have to park in the furthest lots away. And so they're walking five minutes now to get back to their houses. It's about eight to 10 minutes across campus. And, and it, uh, so they do that now. Thanks, Melinda. So it so sounds like yeah. there are at least two good possible solutions. Yes, this has been extremely helpful. I can't thank you all enough. Um, and, I, and again, I wanna say how excited we are to, to actually, um, when we see this thing done, we'll be very proud to have this satellite um, facility here in Northeast Harbor. Yep, sounds so can great. I just thank you all? Thank you all very much. I really appreciate you taking time from your busy agenda. Miller, luck with the Miller yes. my apologies. This is Wendy. Um, but I did send you an email a while back. I think I responded to you about some options and an idea about some parking. So if you did not get that, can you let me know? Um, there, I might have an idea. Okay. I think it may be the same location that Darlin was speaking about. Wendy, I will. I, I thought I responded to you, but if I didn't, I will. I'll make sure I do first thing in the morning. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Good luck Thanks, for Miller. everything. Thanks. All right. Uh, item C request authorization for the fire chief to sign and execute a contract with Maine Maritime Academy to provide the fire department's breathing air cascade compressor vehicle along with an operator in support of their student fire training program at the Ellsworth Fire Training Center. I would move approval. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Thank you. Rural wastewater rebate program and 140 Northern Neck Road.
back at Northern. Nine. Erlen, go ahead. The Kim? Kim is on the line. Kim, I'm not Kim. What, Kim, what's your recommendation on this? Good evening. <laughs> um, well, as you got my memo, this is um, a request for reimbursement for a septic tank pumping. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Ray Bianchi uh, has sent an email and I'm sure you guys have seen it um, with the time limitation that the town has as far as for the rural wastewater rebate program. It's from May to November as far as <clears throat> being um, reimbursed for the septic tank pumping. Um, Mr. Bianchi felt that the time limitation the town has uh, from May to November was not acceptable to him because he has renters. So he had stated his case, as you had seen in the email, um, that um, you know he made arrangements to have his tank pump, whether the town was okay with it or not, essentially, um, and wants to get reimbursed for it. Um, you know, explained, you know, that he pays high taxes on Northern Neck and et cetera, et cetera. You saw the email, I'm sure. Um, I know it's a case by case review that you guys would probably look at this type of stuff. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Bianchi's tank was pumped back in 2014 and it was a day before the deadline date of the program expiring. Um, so it was November 14th that I did an inspection for a septic tank. Um, so he emails me on November 14th telling me he's going to have his tank pumped. I explained to him that the rural wastewater rebate program, pumping program um, expired on November 15th. Um, I had a couple other residents look to uh, get reimbursed as well. Um, couple, I think one of them was a year round resident and the other one was seasonal. And I explained to them also at the time that the program expired on November 15th of 2020, unless there was an emergency. They accepted the fact that the program um, expired on November 15th and they're gonna do it in 2021. Um, but Mr. Bianchi seems to be pushing it, um, wanting reimbursement um, and felt, you know, because he has renters, it was a hardship on him to make arrangements from November to, I mean, from May to November of 2021. And so now he's asking to be reimbursed. I did do the tank inspection because Derlin had asked me to because Mr. Bianchi was more or less directing the inspection regardless. Um, and so here we are. <clears throat> hmm. So are you afraid this is going to open the floodgates? So well, I mean, I, as I explained to Mr. Bianchi, it's not wise to have your tank pump this time of year because it could cause the tank to crack. Um, the state even, you know, confirmed it with me. Um, but uh, Mr. Bianchi just insisted, you know, to, to you. you know, push it to the board of selectmen to see what you guys would think. I don't know if it would open the floodgates, uh, Martha, but it will set a precedent. Like I said, there were two people that accepted the fact that the program um, has deadline dates. And we're willing to work with the town and have it done next year. This is Jeff. I, I think this particular case is, it, it, oh, it seems clear to me that this is a person who made a choice, not, he did, didn't forget, he didn't have a personal emergencies. He made a choice based on his own personal, well, I think financial gain from the renters that it wasn't convenient to, to access this reimbursement. And so, my recommendation would be, you know, sorry, uh, you chose not to do this. He, it wasn't that he wasn't aware that he was supposed to do it. It wasn't any of those things. I would deny this. I would kind of follow up with Jeff said and, and agree with him. You know, it's one thing if, if someone missed the deadline by a couple of days or something, but if, if you're going to have rules, they're useless unless you enforce them. And, um, to me, it, it, like Jeff said, you know, he knew what the what position he was in and decided to ignore um, the advice he was given. Um, you know, you, you don't have to completely shut down a house if you're getting your, your septic system uh, taken care of. Maybe you could charge a little less for that week, the rental that week, if it's an inconvenience for your renters. Uh, 
and none of that is our concern. This is a, if he, it's he goes, not our concern. That's exactly our, right. It's not our concern that he doesn't want to do it because he's got renters. And I don't want to know what's coming through those floodgates. That's for sure. <laughs> no. And I, it doesn't matter that, that, you know, other people have accepted it. You know, honestly, to me, it matters that, that this is a person who chose of his own free will to not access an available reimbursement in order for his business venture to continue to thrive. Uh, that's a choice he can make and he's made yep. it. Yep. So is that a motion? I would move we reject this request. I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any uh, opposed? Oh, sorry. Draft uh, revenue budget review. Okay. <laughs> gave you the, hopefully you all picked up the spreadsheets that I gave you on that, right? I guess you did get one of these. You got them in the packet. Yeah. 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 There wasn't a separate envelope this week. <laughs> that's just not. one, just one piece of paper. Oh, so that's I didn't fine. waste it's the just, envelopes. I, I saw it on the agenda. And then the last couple of times there's been a separate envelope, like, and so yeah. I thought maybe I was missing. I looked again in the uh, back to make sure. Gotcha. Well, the good Sorry to is, confuse you guys. I just put them in the binders for you. Thank you. No problem. I'm Thank you. Got us rattled there. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Keep you off balance. Uh, I think the good news is that the COVID really did not have a, an adverse impact on our revenues. Uh, they they were strong, and they, I anticipate them being strong again this year. And so that's why, in consultation with the various departments that are the experts on these revenues. I think this is a reasonable estimate of what we can we can put through to help reduce the property tax assessment. So which is what these do. They they serve as an offset. So again, my philosophy behind those is to try to be conservative as opposed to being, you know, going for the maximum. So if anything, these probably might be a little bit on the low side, but I think it's it's best to be cautious on those. So these, I think, based on, on the circumstances and the past performance are, are a pretty good uh, reading of where we ought to be on these. Okay. I have nothing in this. Thanks, Darlin. Thank you, Darlin. Welcome. Okay, any further discussion? Great. Thanks for putting that together, Darlin. No Doesn't problem. Doesn't look so bad. My pleasure. Yep. Draft warrant. Here we go. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, excuse me. As, as we go in there, before we start the draft warrant, I just wanted to, I was looking at the agenda and it says that the next meeting is the 16th, but that's not really true because next Monday at four o'clock, we have that annual meeting we have with MD Elementary School and we go over the LUSO ordinances. So we want to make sure that we don't miss that. All right, so uh, that, wait a minute, what, what, what's the date there? The 8th? It's, if you look at your budget uh, sheet, it's February 8th. It didn't have the time on there, but it's, that meeting is traditionally at four o'clock so for the schools, so they're able to come. They, they usually have another night meeting that night, so we pull them in on the afternoon to get that done. Where, where is that listed, Durlin? It's listed. Do you have your uh, budget schedule? Uh, is it in the budget notebook? It should be, yeah. Okay. I always yeah. put a, okay. I put a yeah. schedule in there. Okay. And it should say February 8th, special meeting for ordinances, Luzo and Shellfish review of MDS uh, and revenues. We've just done the revenues, but MDES will still be in there. So. Okay. So Thank we don't you. Wanna, do, we don't want to miss that. That's the big one. Do we have a time? Oh. Is there 
Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. And that's for the elementary budget and the Luzo articles. Yes. Okay. Is that a? I'm just. It's just because I haven't done this before. Is that a? Is that a, a, a five-hour meeting or an hour? No, meeting it's. Or? It's usually an hour, hour and 15 tops. Okay, so I have a 6.30, I won't need to cancel. Oh, no, you'll be done with that. Okay. Thank you. Something's we, gone horribly we, wrong if you have. Famous yeah, we don't load that one up with a lot of special things. Just, I'm very firm I, with the department heads. They can't load that up on that meeting because we have to get those things done, so. Uh, what, did you guys get a chance to look? This was this draft warrant. There isn't anything to vote tonight, but this is your first crack at looking at that. And the way Claire puts this together is articles that are red, are in the color red and not ready. Uh, the ones that are in green are the ones that we have figures and theoretically could be voted at any time. But. <clears throat> We wouldn't want you to vote them tonight in case there are some some changes but the, that's what things look like at this stage if you had a chance to go through those and we'd certainly entertain any any questions that you might have on any of those at this point well i don't have any uh questions but darling could you do me a favor i've got two budget budget books here and neither of them have a a meeting schedule in them. Oh, well, I'll send you. I'll, I'll, I'll email you one, John. Great. Maybe I I share it with everyone else, too. I don't see a meeting schedule in mine either, John. This is Wendy. Okay. I'll just send it to the board in general. I'm, That'd be great. What, make sure that you get them. Okay, I'll do that. Yep. Do that okay. tomorrow. All right, uh, so we have nothing really to get our teeth into here. Mm. Um. Those, uh, those budget articles like Article 28, 29, 30, et cetera, those are based off your initial reviews of your uh, department, departmental budgets. That's what okay, so these are so far. Yeah. So these numbers are, how likely are any of these to change? Well, some of them may change slightly, but they're, they're probably pretty fixed for the most part. Okay. For example, you had talked about maybe bumping up Mike Bender's money for uh, the, the the firefighters, the volunteers, or the on call, I guess is what they were. Uh, so I've talk, I could talk to Mike if he wants to, to, to go in and, re, and redo that line, then I would just simply go back into this book again before you vote and change that number. But I'm going to wait to, after the warrant committee has a chance to talk to him too, before I yeah. do that. So. so we really have nothing to do here, right? It it sounds, Durland, and this is not exactly on topic, but um, I saw in the uh, League of Towns meeting that we, we may be combining costs with, um, was it Tremont? For Tremont and possibly Southwest Harbor. Good. They yeah. haven't decided whether they want to do that or whether they want to do what they did last year, which was to put it all the budgets on the town elections right. and vote them there. So I, I'd say at this point in time, definitely Tremont, but maybe 50-50 with Southwest Harbor as well. Great. Dana Reed is going to be moving in there as the interim oh. for the next right. three to six months. Wow. So he's going to discuss oh, really? it with them. Right. He's everywhere. Yeah. Dana's everywhere. That's right. If he could get Mount Desert, he'd have all four as an interim. <laughs> So if anything happens to me over the thing and Dana's available, put him on and he could go into Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hmm. Anything else on this? Okay, any other business? Tony. Um, yes. 
I would like to apologize to Wendy, the board, and everyone else on this call uh, for what I muttered, muttered under my breath. Uh, I know Wendy, respect her, and I like her. Um, I have quite a, what I consider, a tragic, sad <clears throat> family issue I'm dealing with, and my frustration with that was shown um, in the middle of when Wendy was trying to say something, and I apologize for that. It won't happen again. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. All right. Thank you, Tony. Other business? Any other business? No, nope. treasurer's warrants. All right. Warrants to be approved and signed. Town invoice AP 2143 in the amount of $577,303.11. Move approval and signature, this is Martha. Second that. Second that. All right, Martha, how do you vote? Martha Dudman votes aye. Matt, how do you vote? Aye. Wendy, how do you vote? Aye. Gre uh, Jeff, how do you vote? Jeff Wood votes aye. And John McCauley votes aye, thank you. Authorized warrants to be signed. Um, town state fees and payroll benefits, AP 2141 in the amount of $6,491.92. AP 2142 in the amount of $101,607.56. Town pay payroll PR 2118 in the amount of $101,893.71. Jeff Wood, move approval. Matt Hart will second that. Great. Uh, Jeff, how do you vote? Jeff Wood votes aye. Matt, how do you vote? Matt Hart votes aye. Wendy, how do you vote? Wendy Littlefield abstains. Okay. Martha? Martha Dedman votes aye. And John McCauley votes aye. Thank you. Warrants to be acknowledged. School invoices, school payroll number 16 in the amount of $198,112.86. Uh, this is Matt and I'll move acknowledgement. Second. Martha Dedman seconds. Okay, Matt, how do you vote? Matt Hart votes aye. Uh, Martha, how do you vote? Martha Dedman votes aye. Wendy, how do you vote? Wendy Littlefield votes aye. Uh, Jeff? Jeff Wood votes aye. And John votes aye. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I will take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks.